Thank you. It's always important to ask the feedback loop in Zoom meetings to avoid talking for half an hour and nobody sees my slides. So uh, today I will talk about some of our main research topics currently, which is a uh, federated multitask learning in uh, network data, in, in large, in big data uh, with a network structure. And I will uh, go a bit more into detail about these terms after a quick overview of my journey so far. So maybe some of you don't know me yet. Um, I obtained my Master of Science and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from um, uh, Technical University Vienna. Uh, after some postdoc uh, stretches, I joined uh, Alto University in 2015 as assistant professor for machine learning. And since then, I'm leading the group Machine Learning for Big Data, which has two current main research areas or threats. And beside research, I'm also quite active in teaching some of the larger courses on machine learning in Alto and beyond via the Finnish network, uh, university network PhiTech.io, which is uh, aimed at uh, adult learners, lifelong learners. So just to give a quick overview of our research agenda, uh, Maybe the main research area currently is federated multitask learning. Uh, you see here some of our relevant recent publications. Uh, just want to highlight here the paper on networked exponential families, where I propose an extension of, of statistical, of a very established statistical models, which are called exponential families, and couple them with a network structure. And then we can study the interplay between a network structure and uh, information geometry. So there, there's a geometry coming from the, the network topology, like a cluster structure, and there's a geometry coming from statistical models. For those of you uh, who work in statistics, you might have heard about information geometry. And I'm, I'm interested in the interplay between these different sources of geometry. Uh, yeah, the, I will talk more about this uh, in a second, uh, just continue my overview uh, of the portfolio. Uh, the second research area uh, is on explainable machine learning, which is joint work also with, also with Pedro Nadelli. Uh, here the idea is, or the, the starting point for this line of work is to, to measure the quality of an explanation or the, um, the level by how much something explains something by information theoretic properties in particular. Uh, the prediction that comes out of some complicated, let's say a deep neural network, gives you a prediction for the temperature tomorrow. And uh, for a user, uh, by definition, if, if we consider the black box, it's, um, it's uh, uncertain, the outcome. So uh, it's like a, a random experiment with some uncertainty and providing explanations uh, can then be formulated as uh, a, a method to reduce the uncertainty. So an explanation is anything, any artifact could be, for example, pointing out another uh, training example or pointing out a similar prediction task, that, for example, predicting uh, the day ahead temperature last year. So anything, anything that you provide as information or a, a piece of data could serve as an explanation. However, this explanation should be such that the, once you reveal it to the user, it should reduce the the, the uncertainty in the prediction, given the feedback of the user. So in our approach, we also take into account the, the knowledge of the user, which is also an important aspect of explainable machine learning. The explanations, they should be tailored to a user. So for somebody who never did, uh, never learned uh, linear algebra, never had a linear algebra course, this uh, wide, uh, widespread belief of, of uh, or, or kind of uh, folk wisdom that linear uh, regression models are, are, are interp in interpretable or uh, you can easily explain them might not be true. So uh, somebody who never had a, a course in linear algebra, it might not be, uh, uh, he might not get a good interpretation of, uh, of the outcome of a linear regression model with billions of predictors. Uh, and this, our approach allows to take into account some in some form the 
the user knowledge. So in the most simple setting, we just ask the user to give us a, a summary signal. So we, we present some training data points to the user and he then might ask some multiple choice questions. So the answers of a user to a multiple choice questions could be such a, a summary or a user signal that we then take into account for forming uh, most uh, descriptive explanations. But this uh, is, is in, the, in the very early stages. So research area one is way more progressed and this research area two is just uh, starting to grow. Uh, yes, uh, I also want to highlight my teaching. Um, I'm very passionate about teaching because I consider myself a professor as a union of a researcher and a teacher. So uh, I'm teaching some of the main courses on machine learning and now we had just rolled out our new bachelor course on machine learning which is um, available at Alto and also via FiTech, I think for all students in Finland at all universities. And uh, we had about thousand enrolled students uh, from all six schools of Alto. So not only School of Science, School of Electrical Engineering, the usual suspects, but we also had some students from arts, which was a bit remarkable. So this shows that machine learning becomes uh, a thing in, in every field or has become already a thing in every at least in every field of science and, and technology and this of course makes it also very challenging to teach such courses because you have students with a highly heterogeneous background maybe the the, mo the, the common denominator is a first course on linear algebra but not much more and in order to cope with this i have developed a, a new teaching concept for machine learning which relies uh, very strictly on a three component picture. So I try to explain every machine learning method like linear regression, but also deep reinforcement learning uh, as nothing else but combinations of three components, which is data, a model and a loss. And all this uh, uh, multitude of, of machine learning methods that are currently hip, they are just different design choices for uh, data. Is it text or do we use tensors or do we use uh, matrices to represent data on different design choices for the model? Is it linear functions? Is it a neural network? And different choices for the loss. Do we get the loss from uh, an empirical risk or a training error? Or do we get the loss by some uh, reward like quantity in an online setting, which is related to reinforcement learning? Okay, so this was a quick overview of my research and teaching portfolio. And now I will uh, go a bit more detail of this research area on federated multitask learning from network data. And the idea here is to not only organize data, but also models and the corresponding computations as networks. So try to, to couple these networks as much as possible for data and the corresponding statistical computations, for example, by fitting a, or training a model. Yeah, and just a quick uh, overview of, of some application domains where this might be useful. So network data arises in the internet of things. So uh, the things might be sensing devices, in particular in the industrial internet of things. So the things are, I, I look at the things as data generators. They're just anything, any, any object that can generate data. This could be a human. So I am myself, I'm a data generator uh, using some, some of course device like my smartphone. Uh, but you can also look at uh, a, a smart device or a, a sensing device as a data generator. And these local data sets that these individual things generate, they are connected. So there's some network structure. That's why it's called internet. But this network structure is also uh, present in, in other fields like in weather observations. So you, you look at one observation station. So uh, the Finnish Meteorological Institute runs, uh, would say hundreds of, of weather stations all over Finland. And each weather station generates big data. Each weather, gener each weather station generates uh, uh, temperature, air pressure measurements on a re resolution of minutes. And this is co collected uh, back the last 50 years, say. So each, each station itself generates a, a large data set, but these data sets of the stations are related by a network structure like uh, the, the observations of nearby stations and uh, kind of temporarily successive observations. So there's some notion of spatial temporal proximity. This translates into a network structure and we should use exploit this network structure. 
for example, as a prior for machine learning methods. Another example are uh, uh, repositories or collections of publications like archive. So each data point is one document or one article and uh, Articles might be similar if they have a lot of co-authors or the main author is the same. So you could connect articles with the same first author by an edge. So you get again a networked collection of, of local data sets or local data points. In this case, a data point would be one publication. And then also a, a further topic that I have uh, looked at a bit recently is, is network medicine where one tries to understand, for example, the interplay between different uh, biological properties and diseases via networks. Uh, one such network is called comorbidity network, where each node in the network represents a disease and you connect two diseases if, they, if there are many people having both of these diseases. And then there are people I heard who, who apply clustering algorithms to spot uh, uh, relevant patterns for, for treatment or to, to develop new methods for treatment of diseases. So it goes hand in hand, network science with uh, medicine or uh, healthcare. Okay, so let's now get a bit more formal. Yeah, at this point, are there any questions? I'm happy to stop once in a while to take questions on the way. Any questions at this point, feel free to ask or put the question on the chat. Okay, seems no questions yet. So let me now start to formalize a bit this uh, networked data approach. So we consider network data as a, a, an undirected graph or sometimes call it empirical graph where the nodes on the network, they carry local data sets. And this local data set could be one uh, scalar value like one current reading of a sensor. It could be a whole time series or it could be all the data that is generated by the social uh, media activities of a person. So if a node represents a person, then this local data set might be easily something in the range of, of gigabyte per day or week, because we all, or at least myself, I generate a lot of data, post uh, pictures of nice scenes. So the digital footprint is quite large of, of individuals. So this local data set might be very big data itself already, but then we look at collections, large collections, think on the order of the internet. So, or all humans, billions of humans, which form a social network. So you, you consider some data points similar. And this similarity measure, this, this is depending on the application domain. So one example could be uh, when we recently looked into predicting the risk of COVID infections. So the similarity or this network structure might be obtained from uh, spatio-temporal proximity. So if this person was within one meter at the same time with that person, then we might consider it similar. And the network structure is also known as a contact network. We might use different or, or several forms of network structures. So this would then yield multi-layer networks, but this uh, I will not touch in this talk, uh, where the similarity might also be related to a uh, uh, kind of genetic disposition. So if you have a uh, similar genetic patterns or properties, uh, you might consider the person similar or blood type or whatever is relevant or for, for developing a severe case of, of COVID-19. So in this talk and in this work so far, we assume the network structure to be given. And I just started to look at methods for learning the network structure simultaneously with uh, learning the models for the local data sets. But this is in the very early stages, this work. So in this work, somebody gives us the network structure. Some uh, epidemiologist, some expert for healthcare knows these two persons, they have similar properties uh, regarding their uh, susceptibility for COVID-19 infection. So the network structure is given to us. And we also have a, a weight for each 
uh, edge. So we, we, we measure the amount of similarity. So there are some nodes which are very similar, other nodes which are uh, not so similar or weakly similar. Okay, and now the key idea is not only to attach data to the nodes, so not only the, the local data sets, but also the corresponding models. So we want to learn some parametric model, which is parameterized by a weight vector. Uh, this might be whatever comes into your mind, uh, uh, a time series model, uh, ARMA, uh, moving average, autoregressive model, might be a Gaussian mark of random field, uh, might be latent Dirichlet allocation, anything that you can parameterize by a finite vector or by a finite number of, of uh, parameters, you can use in this approach. So yes, uh, please feel free to drop questions uh, in the chat. I'm happy to take them on the fly and it also helps me to, to slow down at times. Otherwise there's always the risk that I getting faster and faster. Okay. So networked model means we not only have uh, data sets for the nodes, but also some weight parameter of some parameterized model. And how do we learn the weights? Well, you typically have a notion of loss, like the I like Lihut function could be used as a loss or a squared error loss in, in, in supervised machine. When you use here a supervised machine learning model, like a, a linear regression model, then you could use here the, the, the mean squared error or the, the hinge loss or the logistic loss if you have a classification problem. So our approach is very flexible. It just needs a specification of a, of a loss function that tells us how good is a certain choice for the weights. And of course, we want to minimize the loss function. But so this, yeah, minimizing, minimizing the loss function can be, uh, can be considered as a task. So one learning task is to, to minimize the loss function at a certain node. Then there is another learning task, which is minimize the loss function for this node. And this each task could correspond to a person. So uh, this node here represents me. This node here represents my sister, for example. And I want to learn personalized models. So each node has its own model, its own weights. And in the extreme case, I would learn a single separate model for a single data point, which of course is, is, uh, uh, is a mouthful for anybody uh, working in machine learning. You learn separate models for individual data points. Well, the whole idea of machine learning or one of the big ideas is to, to average, to compute uh, empirical risks as an average of the expected loss or something like this. But here we learn individual uh, models, separate personalized models for each data point. And why does it work? Well, because we uh, exploit uh, a clustering assumption. So we say that uh, the models of similar data points should be similar. So the models of, of data points or nodes that belong to, to well-connected subsets of nodes, like here, which we can also call a cluster, they should have uh, similar uh, weights. But of course, if this is true, depends on, uh, on, the, on the network structure that somebody gives to us. So if somebody gives us a bad network structure, then our clustering assumption might be useless. So this, this kind of this clustering assumption relies on uh, the fact that somebody gave us a useful network model. Otherwise, we should learn it from data. And this is something that I'm currently working on. But in, in this case, just to start, to keep things simple, somebody gave us a good network structure, a domain expert. And the good network structure means that this clustering assumption uh, that similar data points, data points that form uh, well-connected clusters should have similar models. And under this uh, clustering assumption, we can formulate uh, a regularization uh, term or a regularizer using this uh, generalized total variation. So this sum here goes over all uh, links. So IJ is connected by an, a link or edge. So we, it's in the sum. Here would be another uh, component of the sum here and here. So we would have one, two, three, four, five uh, components in the sum. And what we sum is uh, the weight of the edge. So if it's a very similar, it's connecting very similar data points, this weight is large. 
otherwise it might be small. And we multiply this weight by a, a dissimilarity measure that, that measures how, how dissimilar or how different the weight vectors at the end of an edge or link are. So this is a penalty function, which typically increases with a larger norm of this difference. So this, this function here phi penalizes large jumps or differences in the weight vectors that are connected by an edge. And requiring a small generalized total variation means then uh, to have the weights being approximately constant over all nodes that have many high weight or large weight links in between them. So we can enforce the clustering assumption by requiring the weight vectors that we learn to have a small generalized total variation. Okay. So this generalized total variation includes some important special cases, which is the total variation, which uh, is just the two norm. So this, uh, the Euclidean norm of the uh, difference in the weight vectors. Another example is the, uh, is the squared Euclidean norm. And then when you plug this in to the general, into the expression of the generalized total variation, you get the squared, uh, the, the graph Laplacian quadratic form. For those of you who have worked with network algorithms or clustering algorithms, you might have heard about uh, such a quadratic form, which is uh, built using the, the graph Laplacian matrix. And it turns out that this generalized total variation includes this as a special case for the choice penalty phi equals the squared Euclidean norm of this difference, weight vector difference. Okay, so we are almost there. So we, we have our clustering assumption. So we want to make this uh, generalized total variation small. Uh, but of course, we, we not only want to make it small, this, this we could achieve easily by choosing all weight vectors be the same, then the generalized total variation is zero. If, if the penalty function is, is zero for zero difference, which is a useful assumption. So we can minimize this easily by setting the weight vectors all constant. But of course, we also have this, this local, local loss functions that force the the weight vectors to be close to the minimizers of this uh, local loss function. So we, we combine those two components and what we then want to do, well, we want to find the optimal balance or compromise uh, by solving this, uh, 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 by minimizing the sum of these two terms. So we have this uh, training error term and this regularization term, which enforces the clusteredness of the weight. So the larger we make this lambda, this parameter here, the more emphasis is put on this clusteredness term, the more we want to, to make the, the weights piecewise constant. And there's some, some critical value of lambda uh, below or above which, so if we choose lambda above this critical value, the best solution is, uh, the, or the solution of this, uh, minimization problem is a constant weight. So for all nodes, the same. Okay, so let me point out uh, two special cases of this uh, generalized total variation minimization framework. The first special case is the network lasso, which has been proposed uh, in 2015. It's also quite well cited this paper by uh, Boyd and coworkers. It's called network lasso clustering and optimization in large graphs. And this network lasso is obtained by choosing the penalty function to be the Euclidean norm. Another special case is called Mokka. This is even more popular, uh, has been um, proposed in a NIPS paper 2017 or NIRIPS paper 2017. It's also quite heavily cited. Uh, and this special case is obtained by choosing the penalty term uh, as the squared Euclidean norm. So our generalized total variation framework includes at least these two very popular approaches as special cases. Okay, any questions up to this point? So,
So we have now this, this general, generalized total variation minimization problem. Then uh, two questions are, what is the computational aspect of this? So how can we solve this optimization problem? And what are the statistical properties of the solution? So are the solutions of this, of this problem anyhow useful? So far, I have used a lot of hand-waving uh, and uh, assumptions like the clustering assumption, which might be not true in practice. So how can we know that this is any useful, uh, what we get out of this minimization? So I will first focus on the question of how to solve this optimization problem. And then I will discuss uh, a, a very simple, uh, but useful statistical analysis of the solutions of this problem. So does any one of you uh, work on, on optimization, convex optimization? Does anyone have a suggestion for how, how to solve this problem or a good, a good idea of what we could try out? Let's assume that the loss functions are convex. And let's also assume that this uh, penalty function is convex. For example, the two norm of this difference. So can, can we, could we solve it via gradient descent? Well, it might be convex. So most of our theory uh, applies only to the case where these loss functions are convex and this uh, penalty function is convex, but still this penalty function might be non-smooth. And actually it's often non-smooth. Like uh, when we look at the, at the network loss suitcase, uh, that's a two norm. This is non-smooth, so it doesn't have a, a, a nice derivative everywhere or gradient. Uh, so we cannot use it. We, we cannot, uh, in general, solve it using gradient descent. But it has a very nice structure because it's the sum of two components. And each component by itself uh, can typically be minimized easily. But the, the difficulty arises from this sum by coupling them, these two components together. And a very powerful idea and a large family of algorithms is based on primal dual uh, decomposition. So I will now explain how we use a primal dual decomposition uh, to solve this, uh, to, const uh, to, to obtain an iterative algorithm that constructs uh, a sequence of weights that converge to the solutions of this minimization problem. Yeah, uh, but just to point out for the special case of Mocha, so using the, the squared two norm here, so this would be smooth, uh, would be a smooth term. And for this Mocha, we could use gradient methods, plain, plain vanilla gradient methods. So that's why Mocha is computationally not that interesting so far uh, for us, but uh, uh, we are still uh, looking at in the statistical properties of Mocha, which is not so well understood. So in these papers, uh, they are mainly focused on the computational aspect. So how can we compute the minimizers efficiently in distributed frameworks using uh, stochastic methods when we have noise, when we have uh, wireless links over which we only can pass uh, noisy messages, uh, but they, I didn't find really a detailed study or a, a broadly applicable study of the statistical properties of the solutions. So does it, for example, always deliver clustered weights? <clears throat> okay, so how do we solve it? Well, we solve it in general for a general uh, penalty function using a, a primal dual method. And as the name suggests, there's some dual com coming into play. And uh, we, can, we can think of, of general uh, GTV minimization as the, the primal form of, of a problem, of an optimization problem, which looks like this. So we have two components. Uh, this first component here is the, the training error term. So here we sum up the, the local losses for all nodes in the training set. So uh, calligraphic M is the set of nodes for which we observe data. So our approach also allows to handle situations where we don't observe 
all local data sets, but only a small, a very small subset M. And this might be very useful because observing or, or reading in a local data set might be computational heavy if the local data set is gigabytes of data. So we might be very interested in methods that get along with a very small training set M. Okay. So this is the training error, first term training. Apologies for my handwriting on my trackpad. Uh, and the second term is the regularization term. So this uh, uh, forces uh, a cluster structure so that the, the weights are clustered. <clears throat> and each component individually uh, can typically be minimized efficiently. So uh, in, for example, we can, we can minimize this function f by separate minimizations for each node. So this sum would then, uh, minimizing this sum would then decompose over the nodes. And similar, the minimizing this term here would decompose into independent minimizations over edges. And this is of course something that we like very much because such, de de uh, such a decomposition of problems uh, is good for uh, making it parallel, uh, making parallel algorithms out of it. Of it that are highly scalable. Uh, however, we cannot really do it separately because they are coupled because of this nasty addition here. And this nasty addition is handled nicely by uh, solving this primal problem uh, together with its dual problem. And here I show the dual problem, which is defined using uh, convex conjugates of these two components. So this uh, convex conjugate function uh, is defined as, as follows uh, using this supremum here uh, of, of linear functions that are shifted by the original functions. So here we have some convex function and we plug this into this supremum, this convex function and get out a new function, which turns out to be convex, which is called the convex conjugate uh, denoted F star. And uh, there's a very nice inter a geometric interpretation of this convex conjugate, which is the shift we need to apply to a, a, a linear, a, a hyperplane or a straight line in the two-dimensional plane with a slope, with a given slope. So I give, uh, I prescribe the slope, which is u in this case. Okay, so yes, so which is a u. And then we ask what is the offset we need to add to this straight line such that it touches the convex function f from which we start at some point. So it, it provides a, a supporting hyperplane to this uh, function f of w. And uh, the, the convex conjugate is exactly the negative of this offset set that we need to apply to a, a, a straight line with a given slope. So this duality is based on, on or can be illustrated by two forms to represent the function. We can represent the convex function f of w by just all the points that are given by the coordinates of the argument w and the function value. So this is called the graph of a function. Or we can say the function uh, is defined by its epigraph and the epigraph, all the points above the function uh, is convex. If f of w is a convex function, so it can be uh, written as the intersection of a family of hyperplanes. And this family of hyperplanes is exactly the parameterization we get from, uh, or the, the convex conjugate is exactly what, what parameterizes this uh, uh, family of hyperplanes used to, to represent this function. And in some occasions, in particular now for solving uh, this minimization problem, it might be easier to look at the function as an intersection of hyperplanes than to look at the function as a, a graph. Okay, uh, I will not go more into detail. I just want to uh, uh, kind of make you, make, you, ma make you an appetite to dig deeper into primal dual uh, methods and into the beautiful theory of convex duality, uh, which is really a beautiful theory, uh, very, very organized, quite closed. So uh, we know pretty much about uh, duality and it's widely applicable. So this uh, applies also to infin infinite dimensional spaces, not only to finite length weight vectors that I'm talking about too. 
Okay, so now we have defined the dual problem of, of, the mini, of our GTV minimization. And it turns out uh, that there's a strong relation between the primal and the dual problem. First of all, the optimal values of the primal and dual problem coincide. This is sometimes called um, a strong duality. So why is this cool? Because it, it gives us a chance to, to obtain lower bounds or certificates for the optimal value of the primal problem. So any for any dual point u that we insert into this dual uh, objective function, we get some value and this must be, uh, this is a lower bound for the optimal value of the primal function. Uh, this might be useful when you want to decide when to stop an iterative algorithm because you can bound how far away are you from the optimal function value. So you can bound the suboptimality. So uh, that's why it's very cool that the optimal values of primal and dual problem are the same. But moreover, there's also a very elegant characterization of solutions to the primal and dual problem. Uh, so any pair of variables, so I give you weight vectors w hat and I give you these dual variables u hat. Yeah, by the way, these dual variables, they are assigned to the, to the edges of the network. So the, the dual variables sit on the edges of the network and the primal variables are the weight vectors of our models. They sit on the nodes. So there's a, a beautiful duality here uh, in this uh, GTV minimization between nodes and edges of a graph or a network. So huh. yeah, this primal dual optimality condition looks like this. So it's a uh, it looks almost like a, a matrix equation, but it, it has here an uh, element. So it's an inclusion, not really an equation, but uh, there's a lot of, we, we can, for our intuition, you can think of this being a uh, equality sign. So there's not much harm if you, just for the intuition, building an intuition, you think of this as an equality. So in order to find a, a primal solution, so in order to find a solution to our minimization problem, W hat, we need to find a dual variable u hat, which together with this uh, w hat solves this uh, uh, equation. Uh, and this is uh, kind of a zero. So we, we are looking for w hat and u hat that are, is a zero of this operator here. So this is an operator. This is not the matrix, but this is an operator. Uh, so we, we need to find a zero of an operator. So did any one of you ever use algorithms for finding the zeros of an operator? So you can, can find zeros of an operator or you find zeros of equations. Uh, in many cases by uh, fixed point algorithms, or in this gen more general case, we call it a proximal point algorithm. So in order to solve the, the TV, uh, GTV minimization and its dual, we have to find solutions to this equation here, to this zero, uh, or uh, we have to find zeros of this operator. And to find zeros, what we do is, we just do a fixed point iteration that pushes the iterates towards the zero of such an operator. And this is called a proximal point algorithm. So the proximal point algorithm works by take the operator of which you want to find, to find the zeros, add the identity operator, take the inverse and iterate this mapping. So this, this uh, inverse here is also called a resolv uh, resolvent operator. Resolvent of, of this operator here in between is the resolvent. And it might seem very heavy mathematics, uh, but it's very, so it's abstract, but it's very widely applicable. So whenever you, you can formulate your problem in a way that it's uh, equivalent to finding the, the zeros of an operator, you have basically for free, you get an iterative algorithm to solve your problem, just use the proximal point algorithm. <clears throat> okay, so, this 
might look a bit uh, hmm, uh, menacing, so not so useful, but it turns out when you work this out, when you evaluate this inverse or this resolvent operator, uh, it turns out you get a very nice and uh, convenient message passing algorithm. So when you, when you uh, evaluate this resolvent here, you can find the update equations. So you get from the current uh, estimates for the primal variables and dual variables to the next, to the improved ones. And these updates uh, have this form, which is summarized here in our algorithm one. So you have two basic blocks. One block is um, a primal update uh, or a node-wise update. So we have at each node, we update the current guess for the weight vectors. So we want to find weight vectors that have a small local loss, but also have a small total vari generalized total variation. So in this here, in this update, we focus on the local loss. So this is somewhat like a, a primal update. So here we want to only make the local loss smaller. And then there's another type of update for the edges. So in this, we want to make the penalty term smaller. So we want to make the generalized total variation smaller. Uh, and the, those two alternating primal and dual optimization steps, they are coupled by simple, nice matrix operations. In particular, these matrix operations involve only the or involve the the incidence matrix of the graph and this means if you write this down the incidence matrix this means these are message passing updates where all these steps here amount to passing messages between nodes and its immediate neighbors in each step we only have to do local computations for each node so this uh, primal updates we have to do local uh, computations for each edge which aim at making the, the, the signal or the weight differences over the edge smaller. And then these local computations result in new intermediate results. And these intermediate results are shared among neighboring nodes and among uh, the adjacent nodes of an edge. So this edge here shares its results with these attached nodes. And these nodes pass on their intermediate results with the neighboring nodes. So this is a, a, a local algorithm which scales to very large graphs as long as they are sparse. So as long as they have small, a small number of neighbors for each node. OK, yeah, here shown in more detail. So this algorithm, uh, algorithm one consists of fully local computations, which is nice from a uh, parallel computation point of view. So we have for each node, we have to compute this uh, primal updates. And these primal updates, they aim mainly at making this local loss smaller. So we want to make the local, we want to adapt the weight vector so that it better fits the local data. However, we regularize this local loss by some regularization term. And in this regularization term, we, we couple the weights between different nodes. And then we have local updates, not only on the nodes, but also local updates for each edge. So for each edge, we run this, uh, again, uh, minimization problem, which aims at making the, the penalty smaller. So making the difference of the weights over that edge smaller. But we also have a regularization term here. And this regularization term, again, couples those two updates. But it couples it in a nice way. Uh, this coupling can be. Uh, implemented only by this uh, using this uh, uh, matrix uh, operations here. So this is a coupling term, and here we have a coupling term. So in these two steps, we take care of all the coupling, and once we have taken care of the coupling, the individual uh, we can do this individual optimizations or updates for each node and for each edge. Okay. So why is uh, this algorithm attractive? Let me again try to sell it to you. Why primal dual methods are really good for, for federated learning? Well, uh, it, it has a high level of robustness against various errors or failures. So if in this primal updates, if you, if you do not minimize this exactly, but you only use, for example, you use here some, some gradient descent method to minimize this, which doesn't converge perfectly, it's the whole primal dual algorithm can tolerate this. Also, in this message passing, when you spread the results over the edges, 
if there are some errors uh, arising, for example, from having these links being wireless communication links with some uh, noise on it, it doesn't matter too much. As long as the noise is controlled, the overall primal dual algorithm still converges. So it's very robust against errors or imperfections. Uh, then it also allows, and there's uh, more and more work on, on stochastic versions. So instead of doing these updates for all edges and for all nodes, you randomly select a small subset of nodes and a small subset of edges for which you do the update, but you, you ignore the updates for all other edges. And this, you can save computation while still getting uh, acceptable accuracy. Uh, yeah, then one of the main uh, advantages or aspects of algorithm one is uh, there's no raw data exchanged. So we exchange only uh, updates for the weights, for the, for the model parameters. At no point we exchange any part or any fraction uh, of raw data. So this raw data stays only with the nodes. This is not uh, revealed to anybody else. Only uh, these updates for the, for the weights. This is what is shared. Okay. So uh, now this is basically the what I wanted to say about the computational aspects of uh, GTV minimization. Now the next question is, uh, are they any good the solutions? So does it make any sense? And to answer this, we use a simple clustering assumption. So we assume that uh, the network consists of well-connected clusters. So by well-connected cluster, I mean, uh, it is a subset of nodes such that we can route a relatively large amount of flow over the boundary edge to each observed data set so, or the training set. So this field nodes here are the training set. And we assume that the clusters are so well connected that I can route, for example, two units of flow over the boundary edge without, set, without uh, saturating any edge in the in the cluster. So we measure this uh, quality of a cluster or the connectivity of a cluster using network flows. And then we, we uh, were able to derive bounds on the estimation error. So if the true weights are piecewise constant, so they are constant for all nodes in this cluster and constant in this cluster, but they might be different across clusters. But within the cluster, the weights are all the same. Uh, and if the, the boundary is small enough such that we can route a multiple number uh, of units of, of this boundary edge or of the, of the capacity of this boundary edge through the, the training set, then the, this error will be small. Uh, yeah, so again, we measure the connectivity by flows. We say that uh, the cluster is well connected uh, if we can route uh, a multiple units of this boundary capacity through all the intracluster edges without saturating any of these uh, intracluster edges. For example, if all <coughs> edges here have a capacity of one, then we could route here uh, a, a flow of value two because we can route here one unit to the sampled node and we could route here one unit to this sampled node. So we could route double the capacity of this boundary node through all the sampled nodes. And as soon as this is possible, our uh, GT minimization uh, uh, kind of locks, in the, uh, locks into the right clustering structure. Um, we have this verified by uh, some simple numerical experiments. So we have uh, run our algorithm and measured the deviation between the the result of our algorithm and the true underlying weights, which we know because we generated the data. Uh, and there's some threshold for the cluster connectivity. So as soon as the cluster connectivity is, uh, <clears throat> is larger than the square root of two in this case, uh, our algorithm perfectly finds the right cluster structure. And it turns out that we can predict uh, that our analysis uh, analysis allows to predict this threshold. It's the, the square root of the, the dimension of the feature vectors used in this uh, local data sets. So if the local data sets have, uh, uh, consist of, of uh, feature vectors of length two, then this uh, cluster connectivity threshold is the square root of two. And uh, 
kind of this is confirmed here by this experiment. So we we can tell pretty precisely how how uh, how pronounced this cluster structure has to be such that this GDV minimization finds the right cluster structure. Okay. So to wrap up, uh, we have formulated federated learning as a optimization problem, as a generalist total variation minimization. This includes as two special cases, the network lasso and MOCA. They are obtained for special choices for the penalty function that defines the generalized total variation. Uh, we have uh, solved this uh, GTV minimization using a um, a very popular primal dual method for convex optimization. This primal dual method results in a highly scalable and robust implementation in the form of message passing. So we can uh, solve this minimization problem by message passing over the data network structure. Um, and we also have uh, uh, studied under which conditions on the network structure the, the GTV minimization is, is, uh, succeeds in finding the right cluster structure. So to, to pool the, the right local data sets together to form a larger training set for, the, for learning the local predictors or local models. Yeah, so <clears throat> I hope to have convinced you a bit that primal dual methods are really uh, a good hammer for federated learning, in particular federated multitask learning uh, in networks. Okay, that's from my side. Uh, any questions at this point? Thanks, Alex. So I think there are a few questions in the chat. So let's. Let's see here. So, Ioannis, Ioannis would like to make your question uh, uh, yourself. Okay, fine. Thanks, uh, Pedro. Uh, this is Yanis Christou. Um, my basic question, uh, first of all, thanks for, the, for a very nice uh, talk. And uh, my main question is the following. Uh, given that uh, the total objective that uh, you are minimizing is non-convex, since the second term is uh, non-convex, uh, what guarantees, uh, and since uh, whenever you have a non-convex function, uh, you are not guaranteed uh, to find the global optimum uh, via any method, whether you try global, unless you have some special structure and you can guarantee that uh, your algorithm finds the global minimum of your phi of your of your second term. Uh, what uh, guarantees do you have that uh, basically producing only a local minimizer for the second term will uh, still allow you your uh, will allow the total uh, message passing algorithm to converge to the global optimum? of the entire function that you are minimizing? Yeah, very good question. Um, um, I'm sorry, I didn't make it explicit enough. So our analysis only works for convex phi. So this phi is assumed convex. Uh, for the special cases um, here for the lasso, it's the two norm, it is a convex function. And here it's the squared Euclidean norm is also convex. So all our algorithm, uh, our analysis applies only to convex phi uh, and to convex loss functions. This rules out, unfortunately, of course, uh, deep neural networks. In principle, we could plug in uh, this primal loop update and we try it out in our experiments. We do that, of course, uh, in this primal updates, uh, we can, so here we can input any, any local model which has a loss function and which we optimize by some optimizer, for example, using PyTorch. So we could plug in here also some deep neural network, but uh, our theory only applies to convex loss functions and to convex phi. For, for non-convex phi, we, we don't have any results, unfortunately. Okay, so uh, for the theoretical case, basically any algorithm for convex optimization will work since the sum of two convex functions are, is still convex and therefore you are whenever you obtain a local minimum, you are guaranteed to that this local minimum is also your global minimum, right? 
Yes, yes. So you, you could use uh, uh, sub gradient descent. Right, uh, right. Definitely. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Yonis. Thanks, Alex. Other questions? Uh, I think Arthur has one question. Arthur, can you make your question? I don't know if he's here. He, he basically asked in the chat, regarding convergence time, are these solutions faster than other conventional approaches? Uh, yeah, very, also very good question. Uh, it can be shown that this primal uh, dual method is is optimal in a worst case sense. So you can come up with uh, network structures, in particular with chains, a chain structure like in time series data, where you cannot beat uh, the convergence speed of primal dual methods. However, this is just a a worst case result. So for typical networks where you have uh, a, a pronounced cluster structure, it might well be that our primal dual method is not, is not the fastest. And for example, uh, it might be better to use uh, some, uh, uh, I don't know what is there, of subgradient methods. So, uh, but in the worst case, uh, one cannot beat the convergence time of this primal dual method. But we, we didn't look yet into, into a, finer convergence results that, that take more structure into account, like a, a cluster structure of the of the network. Thanks, Alex. So I, there is probably one more, probably the last question. So Alexei, could you like would like to make your the question yourself? So you, you, you can use the mic if you want. So because I don't if I read it, I think it's not the the best way to. Ah, sh should I read it? No, I well, I, 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 I well, you can do it. I can do, but I, I well, like the person that who wrote to do it, but probably persons are shy still. Yeah. So if well, I can, I can, I can uh, uh, read it. So does the model transfer only solve the problem of high data volume to send? or privacy is also strongly improved, or it is still possible to recover and identify raw data from the model for an EVIS dropper? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, I, I, as I said, there's no raw data shared directly, but of course, in these updates here, uh, the data is used to find the, the minimizer and it depends on the, on the local models how much information pours into this update. So uh, this depends if you have only one single data point at the node, and, and this, is only, uh, this is also not belonging to a larger cluster, then it might be that this, this weights, the weight update still carries uh, some information about the individual. But as soon as you have, for example, a local data set being a population of many data points, then you get immediately some averaging uh, that, that protects the privacy of an individual in the population. And moreover, you can also, as I said, uh, as I pointed out, this primal dual method is, is robust against errors. And you can also inject errors intentionally in this, in this primal update. So you can inject noise to perturb the primal update in order to to, to uh, increase the privacy protection, but the overall effect will then be uh, vanishing. So the primal dual method will still learn good weight vectors if the, if the noise that is injected is not too large, but might be still enough to protect the privacy. Very good, Alex. So I think maybe you are on time. So maybe just one question by myself and based on our discussions from last month or so. So uh, do you think that those algorithms are applicable in, in, like a, a, in real devices and uh, what are the challenges that you see when you have like a real IoT or real industrial IoT devices being itself a node that needs to communicate? And so do you have any uh, ideas about like the real in the practical challenge of having this solution implemented? 
Yeah, so in this form, uh, as I showed it, this algorithm is uh, needs to be executed synchronous. So one first challenge is, of course, if, if you cannot easily maintain a synchronous operation. So you have asynchronous, so each node does an update whenever he or she has time or resources. So this, this leads to this straggler problem. But even for this case, they are just uh, looked into, into literature. There's recent work that, that shows that these primal dual methods are also uh, robust against stragglers. So they, they are not slowed down terribly if there are some nodes which just uh, cannot do the update due to overload, uh, work overload. Uh, but other than that, of course, uh, I didn't uh, look uh, too much into this implementation aspects. And this would be great if we, at some point, could could do something together and uh, run a uh, and demonstrate on real hardware. Yeah, very good, Alex. Thanks, and hopefully, the people that gives money for research will <laughs> also think that this is a good idea. Yes. So thank you, Alex. And, thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody that uh, make questions and. On her Alex, very nice. And I, I'm sure that feel free to contact him if you want to know more and, and collaborate. So now you go to our next. So here